Questions or comments? Uh, Saidna, yani, uh, during the service we face many people if they are in dispute or something like that, they say, uh, give me a practical uh, solution, I'm not Christ. So how can we respond uh, biblically, practically? So my response, someone says, you know, I'm not Christ, is you're not being crucified, you're not being nailed to a cross with people spearing you in the side and putting a crown of thorns on your head because you wouldn't have been able to cope with that. So everything is relative. God does not expect of us more than we are able to bear. And so whatever you are going through, you are totally within your ability to bear it because you don't need to bear it alone. Not only do you have the power of our Lord Jesus Christ and His grace, but you have people around you. You have a family, you have friends, you have confession father, you have servants, you have all of these people who carry with you. It's only when we feel that we're totally alone and have to deal with things alone that we can't see anything else. And so it's important for us not just to not just rely on ourselves at these times. I think that, that's very important. And to realize that we have a support structure in our family, in our church, that is essential for us to keep carrying these. And to realize, as the scriptures tells us, that this is just the kind of thing that befalls all humanity, and that there will be no temptation, that there will be no struggle without the means to bear it. As those who are before us come through, will go through it as well. It just seems like it's unbeatable at the time, because we're looking at it very differently. We just need to step back a little bit and look at it more. Now we had two questions during the talk, so I want to go one and then two, right? Okay. So um, I was just wondering, when Jesus said, "Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing," was he just I, like I was? I was talking with someone before, and they're like, he was just praying. It doesn't mean that the Father actually did forgive them, but. He, he did forgive them, right? Of course. I mean, don't forget that the Son is God as well. Right. It wasn't a prayer, it was an actual, actually forgive them. But I think more than just for their forgiveness, it was a lesson to us. So, like, I understand that it's a lesson to us, and that makes sense that we should do that with others. But does this actually, like, work like this with God? Like, are all the people who are, like, bombing churches, like, are they being forgiven because they don't know what they're doing? Only if they're repentant. But they didn't repent. Okay, so they're not going to be forgiven. No, the people who crucified Jesus. Then they're didn't. not going to be forgiven. So forgiveness, I mean, for me, for you to ask for me to be forgiven is one thing. But for me to take the steps to be forgiven, that's something different. So those who were at the cross, and some of them were, who repented and turned back and said, we've done a great injustice, they were certainly forgiven. But for those who stayed in their sin without repentance, without, without return, how can they be forgiven for something they don't think is wrong? That's the whole point. You can only be forgiven if you take responsibility for what you've done in those wrong. And I think that's a lesson to all of us. Just as, just as them. You know, we always think, what about people who are bombing churches? But what about us? What about when I do something to someone else and I don't see a need to repent? I'm not going to be forgiven. Uh, you said that the people or the Romans, when they like put Jesus in a tomb and then rolled the stone and put soldiers, you said that they were afraid that he was going to resurrect, but they didn't believe that he resurrect, that he would resurrect. I thought that they did all that because they thought the disciples were going to steal the body. For both reasons. Both reasons, because they thought that, you know, that they, because he said, I will destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days. So that prophecy was in their minds. But they also thought, actually, you know, even if that's not true, his disciples are going to come and steal his body to make it look like it's true. So they, they covered both of those possibilities. It was definitely in their minds. Yeah. So when you were talking about like blind, blind obedience, like I was thinking about like stories like with monks, like St. John the Short when he was told to like plant like a stick. Mm. So how do you like discern whether it's like like if, if that was told to me I would like think it's just like foolishness, like I wouldn't bother listening, but like how do you discern whether 
it's, it's based on trust. So if you look at the monastic fathers, and even with, you know, with myself going through our monastic life, there are things I was asked to do that I would have, you know, in my mind thought, what is nonsense? But I decided I chose to do what I was asked because I had trust in the person asking me. And that's why if you look at monastic life generally, it works on a model of mentorship and guidance and discipleship. And so in those stories, in those accounts, that's not blind that's not blind obedience, that is a selective decision to follow something even if it looks highly improbable, if not totally ridiculous. But it's a decision at the same time. Because don't forget as well, when you look at ascetics, right, monastic, it takes a whole lot of resolve and stubbornness to leave the whole world and go against it and go into this life. And so it's that same resolve that says, okay, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to hand over my will and I'm going to trust you. How could we submit or subject our will to Christ? I was asking how do we subject... I, I, of course, I want to know all these answers. He's just prompting me. No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to benefit from you. He's prompting me because you know, he wants me to <laughs> tell you. Um, how, how do we subject ourselves to Christ? I think mean, in very much the same way, it comes from a trust. So it comes from either me experiencing him in the past, or because of the accounts of scripture, or the saints, or the church, or what I've heard, or people around me, then I think, well, I should trust as well. And especially when it just doesn't seem to make sense. That's when I need to subject myself even more. But it does come from experience. And it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to have happened to me personally. But if it, even if it's happened to someone close to me, then that's a lesson to me. I've seen, I've seen some person say, actually I did this, or I saw it in his or her life. I come around and think, actually that, that looks really good. I, I want to be part of that as well. Is that a question? Yeah. So how can we like, like build that trust? Because like, there's a lot of times where that, t that trust can be like, not broken, but kind of weakened. Like you've gone through experiences, and then it makes you fall back. What's what's something that would make you push push forward into going back to it? It's gradual. See, unfortunately, we we now always want a quick fix, and this stuff there are no quick fixes about it. It is gradual. Uh, it means. It means I need to trust. I need to build the trust. So, you know, do you have any close friends in this room? Yeah. Okay, so of those close friends, you've had trust built up over time and through experience. You've trusted with small things and you've learned that that's, they're worthy of the trust and it keeps growing day by day. Our problem with God is, I don't know if you've heard me say this before, we have a, a vending machine approach to God. Right? Uh, you, you sort of, he's out there in the corridor, always there. You walk past him every day, you only stop when you want something. And when you stop, you sort of put your couple of coins in, you pray, you press the button, you do all the right things, and then you take what you want, and then you move on again. So we don't actually leave an opportunity to have a relationship grow. And so it becomes really difficult to trust over time. And you were talking earlier about um, being living in this life and we are different than the people who surround us. And there is a pressure and there is that I don't want to look like way different than the people. I don't drink, I don't wear some stuff, I don't do a lot of people. So how can we accommodate this peer pressure and live our life? Did everyone hear that question? No. Okay, the question is, I said we're supposed to be countercultural. Right? Our things around us are different, and we don't want to look odd, so how do we do that on a practical basis? Okay? Have you seen some of your hairdos? <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen some of the clothes you wear? Right? It's really odd. <laughs> and, you're not, you're not, and you're not afraid to look odd, because it's fashionable. 
They're not afraid to listen to ridiculous music because everyone else is listening to it. They're not afraid to do crazy things on the web and on your social media because everyone else does it. So you know what? You don't mind looking foolish sometimes as long as everybody else is looking foolish. Right? My answer is step up. Be the right person. Make the right choices. You know, we turn around and say, no, 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 I can't look strange. Really. How do you think I feel? And you know what? I don't care. I really don't. It doesn't bother me. People say to you, we need to change, change our investments. But you know what? I walk down the road and people walk past me with their hair dyed blue. <laughs> and they have piercings and they have tattoos that I have no idea what they're going to do with in 30 years time. <laughs> but apparently they're normal and I'm not. <laughs> Seriously guys, get your priorities right. Be willing, be confident to be different for the right reason. Don't be bullied. You do things, you make decisions, so that you don't look strange. But you let yourself be manipulated and bullied. Be strong. I'm saying to you, be strong. Make decisions. Do the right thing. Say the right thing at the right time. And that's what Christianity is about. That's what anything is about. You know, being true to yourself. You know, this, this, I'm, I'm an individual, I'm not changing for anything. But you have the same hairdo, you wear the same clothes, you do the same walk as everybody else does in your group. There was one particular example of a young woman who was serving with me, and she said, you know, it's really funny, we're sitting down having a, a Sunday school class for a group of teenage girls. And, um, and they all said, no, 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 we don't want to have Sunday school go to church because you know we don't want to fit into a mold. They look across and they had the same chinos on, <laughs> with the same shoes, and the same hairstyle, all of them, without exception. And so there are many things we are willing to conform to. But conform to the right things. You know when you talk about alcohol for instance, no no no, if I go to a party, um, I need to drink so I don't feel left out. Who cares? I mean, seriously, if someone is going to trust you on what is in your cup, then do you really want that recognition? They're leaving you, they're leaving your identity, they're leaving your mentality, they're leaving your choices, they're leaving your lifestyle, they're leaving your intellect. They don't care about a thing, they're gonna judge you on what's in your cup. Keep the cup. <laughs> seriously, do you understand what I'm saying? Be bold, be confident, be strong. Don't be, don't be pushed around. Imagine, imagine your parents coming to you on Sunday morning and say, no, no, Habib, what you're wearing is totally unacceptable. You shouldn't go to church like that. What's the first thing you say? Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> don't tell me what to wear. I don't mind, I want to be different. Really? What about being different at that party? What about being different in your school? Being different in the world? Why is it that now you don't want to be different anymore? It frustrates. Can you tell I'm frustrated? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure that that message is getting out there. Right? It frustrates me when I see good people like you being dominated and manipulated and subdued with silliness. I was going to say stupidity, but I didn't. <laughs> Why? Are you, are you serious? You're going to trust, you're, you're going to judge me based on the fact that I don't have a cigarette in my hand? Now, you know what? You athletes and sports people who put your hands up earlier, if you're in Olympic trials and your coach said to you, don't touch alcohol, don't have a cigarette, 
don't have sex for your training period, you would have to do it, right? So it's okay because you're an athlete, but it's not okay because you're a Christian? Really? That one thing, yeah, right. If I had a microphone, I would have just dropped it. Side of Obviously, we agree with you 100%. Um, I just want to add something that we discovered our youth group in church, and we kind of changed the terminology a little bit, and it actually helped a lot of the youth to kind of rethink what we were saying. So everything that Satan just said, we agree with 100%. But instead of saying we're being different, actually following Christianity and following the teaching of the church is normal. So if I want to be normal, then I'm going to be a Christian. And anything outside of Christianity is different, is abnormal. Meaning what you know what Satan is saying. So. I'm not being different as much as I'm being normal. This is what Christ's intention is, and why I was created on earth, why the teachings of the Bible is there for us, and I'm going to live a normal life as a Christian. I'm going to... I'm sorry, Sid. Go ahead. I love you, and we're, we're brothers, but can I challenge you? Am I wrong? Oh. Can I challenge you? Oh. 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 That's normal for you and me. But for the world, it's radical. So be radical. We need to reclaim this word radicalize. I don't want you to think of the word radical as pertaining to a terrorist who blows himself up. I want you to, to choose the word radical to pertain to you when you are strong enough and dedicated enough and committed enough to make a decision that goes against everybody else. It's normal for us. It was normal when the disciples were together, it was totally normal for them, but it wasn't normal for the rest of the world. And so what Abul is talking about is our inward looking in ourselves. Listen, we're normal here. We're not abnormal. We're not strange. These are absolutely right. When we look at the scriptures, they make sense to us and we need to actually follow them. But for the world, we're going to look strange and odd and radical. And you know what's so neat? So yes, that needs to be the norm. The fact that I don't drink should be, so I don't drink. What, what's your problem? Yeah, I, I don't understand. You know, I decided not to drink. Thanks. Yeah, you know, if if you are if you are a conservative Jew mm -hmm. and you only eat kosher food or you observe the Sabbath, if you are a, a, a conservative Muslim who uh, keeps Friday and fast Ramadan. If you are a conservative Sikh or Hindu or Buddhist, that's great. But to be a conservative Christian, you're a bigot and a radical and you're unloving and you're unwelcoming and you're unaccepting. Why? Why? Who made these rules? And why on God's earth do we follow them? Two words. What are they? Step up. But I love you. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, sorry, no one. Um, when are you coming again? <laughs> what, because you want to be out of town? <laughs> uh, I, I, thank you. <laughs> Won't happen again. <laughs> that was my lawyer speak for I'm not committing right now. <laughs> but it's, it's always good to be back. And you know what? I just this is why I love doing what I do. Because I can stand here and tell you this, and I'm suddenly seeing light bulbs going off, thinking, hey, he's making sense. <laughs> and the thing that actually is quite disturbing is, but we didn't expect him to make sense. <laughs> I can see that too, so watch what you think. <laughs> But, but it does make sense. It does make sense. And, and you know, use it. Use it. So, oh sorry, I had a question. Last one, then I'm going to take my ten points, so think. Okay, so like earlier, we were talking about how like, the Christian thing to do is to love like, in case of the culture, and then like, how to love the culture. So then, like, um, 
just taking it like this different like how would like what is it is there a certain point that we should um believe like people should be punished or not punished? Like the question is, although we're supposed to forgive, should people who are punished not punish? You know, when I say forgive the terrorist, I don't mean that he or she should not be held accountable before the war. Because I precisely say that. I say that anyone who breaks the law needs to be accountable, including myself. But I need to forgive the other person for his or her sake and mine. Because I don't want my heart corrupted. What, what happens, however, so, you know, if, and I encourage you to have a look at some of the statements we've put out. If you just go to bishopangelos.org, or if you go to the Twitter feed, you'll see a whole lot of statements we've put out on the attacks in Egypt, on the attacks in England, and, and stuff all over. And our message is always consistent. It's hold people accountable, we call for justice, we want justice to be done, but we love and we forgive and we reconcile. And that's the message of our Lord. He, he, he reconciled the whole world, but he was, in that, but, you know, he was bold enough to challenge and say, well, you know, what about these people? What about people who are persecuted? And he liberated them. So I think that's, that's our message. That's what we should do. All right, 10 points. One. Step up. Step up. <laughs> Two. Yep. Oh, when you feel like the most unworthy, that's when when you feel the most unworthy, it's when you most least want to go, yes. Um, my identity isn't just based on the decisions I make, but the reasons behind them. Right, my identity is not just based on the decisions I make, but on things that God has given me, yes. You're different. We're different? Be radical. Be radical? Keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. Forgive those who persecute you and love those who hate you. Forgive those who persecute you, love those who hate you? I was going to say that. Say it again. Love your haters. Great. <laughs> 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 you can never say that too many times. Anyone else on set? Happy. Down the back. Uh, to hear God's will, you have to think like Him. To hear God's will, you have to think. To, like have, to hear and know God's will, you need to think like Him. Who else? Yes. Your strategy against evil should be love. You get your strategy against evil should be love. When you think like Christ, you like put away all the human things. But when you think about when you think like Christ, you put away the human things. Go upstream. Like Go upstream. Go radical. Your father of confession has heard everything. Your father of confession is your guide, is your uh, reference point, is your everything in terms of your gender. Nothing I say can shock you. Nothing you say can shock me, I hope. No, nothing you say can shock me. Yes. True obedience is a proactive decision, not a mindless and powerless act. Anyone else? Glory be to God forever. Amen. It's been so much fun being with you guys. Thank you so much. I'll one thing before I go, and that is, I don't do high school anymore. Um, I, just because of my limited time, I tend to do college, mainly grads and young adults. But you guys have been phenomenal today. You've been focused, you've been attentive, you've been on the ball. And seeing you this morning turn up, turn up to liturgy on time, you are an exceptional and exemplary group of young people. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.